Welcome to Abergavenny Baptist Church. Life, faith, together. The Bible reading is from Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 to 15. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. The earth and the heavens fled from his presence, and there was no place for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged according to what they had done, as recorded in the books. The sea sea gave up the dead that were in it. And death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And each person was judged according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is a second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, today we continue in our series entitled the, the Big Story of the Bible, Finding Our Place in God's Story. You see, the Bible tells one big unified story that finds its climax in Jesus, and so it's the, the story of God, and it's the true story of the world, and I invite you to find your place within the story. And today we are finally in the final act. We're in Act 6, Restoration, the King Returns. Now you will remember how God created a good world that has gone bad because humans have grasped for the fruit of autonomy. There is evil in our hearts. And as a result, evil and sin and death and decay have entered into God's good creation. The whole of creation has gone out of sync. It's become corrupt. But God doesn't abandon us. God doesn't give up on His creation project. He still believes in us, and He still loves us. And so He comes to us in the person of Jesus. And on the cross, God deals with evil. God defeats evil. Evil, sin, and death are now a defeated foe, a defeated enemy. But they're not yet destroyed. Uh, Evil, sin, and death is still very much alive and active within the world today. It's only when Jesus returns that evil will be finally completely destroyed never to return, and then the new creation can begin. Restoration can begin. And this is what Acts 6, the story of restoration, is all about. And and Acts 6 is broken up into two scenes. Scene 1, judgment, out with the old. Scene 2, new creation, in with the new. You see, before you can have new creation, a a new creation that's in sync with God, that's in harmony, you first need to get rid of all evil. And today, so today we're going to be focusing on scene one, judgment out with the old. And so we turn to the very last book in the Bible, the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 20 and verses 11 to 15, we get this vision of God's end time judgment. And in verse 12, we're told that the dead, great and small, that means everyone, everyone is going to stand before the throne of God. And we read in verse 13 that the sea gave up the dead that were in it, and the de- and death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. Now this is just reflecting the, the basic concepts and imagery of the afterlife that most Jews in the first century believed in. Hades was the realm of the dead. It was the place where the dead would go. It, it, it could be translated the grave. 
And so if you died, you would go into Hades, unless, of course, you died out at sea, in which case you wouldn't go into Hades, but you would go into the abyss, which was the, a kind of watery grave within the sea. Of course, if you put your faith in Jesus, when you die, you would physically go into Hades, but your spirit would be kept safe with Jesus. But on Judgment Day, everyone would come alive again, and each person would be judged according to what they had done. And then we read in verses 14 and 15, Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. The lake of fire is the second death. Anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life, in other words, anyone who had not put their faith in Jesus, was thrown into the lake of fire. So, so death itself and Hades and anyone who hadn't put their faith in Jesus was thrown into the lake of fire. Now, the, the lake of fire was the place where all evil that had marred and corrupted God's good creation was sent. So earlier in the chapter, in verse 10, we read, And the devil who deceived them was thrown into the lake of burning sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet had been thrown. Okay, so who are these three characters? Well, it's important to state right at the forefront uh, that the book of Revelation uses imagery and very colorful symbolic language. And so the devil represented evil itself, cosmic spiritual evil. And the beast represented evil political powers that were exploiting people, that were oppressing people. At the time of writing the book of Revelation, the beast was the Roman Empire. And even today, there are many oppressive political powers that are causing endless cruelty to many people and endless suffering to many people. And then the false prophet represented institutional evil. In that day, it was the imperial cult that was promoting the worship of the emperor. If you did not worship the emperor, then you would be economically exploited. You, you weren't able to trade. You weren't able to run your business. Or you were even physically tortured and then murdered by being fed to the lions as part of the public entertainment. And so Christians in that day were faced with a very real choice of either renouncing their faith in Jesus or being economically exploited and possibly physically tortured and fed to the lions. And even today, there are Christians who face very similar choices. And even today, there, there is institutional evil. It might not be as bad as, as the imperial cult, but we still have institutional evil in certain police forces, in some big businesses, in some media outlets, and so on and so on. But a day is coming when all institutional evil, all political evil, and evil itself will be no more. It will be thrown into the lake of fire, and it will be destroyed forever, never to return. And so too, death, that, that last great enemy that has marred God's good creation, Death itself will be thrown into the lake of fire and destroyed forever. There will be no more death. But so too will those who have not put their faith in Jesus. They too will be thrown into the lake of fire. Now this is a very uncomfortable read and it raises a lot of questions. But again, we need to emphasize that the book of Revelation is using symbolic language. And so the lake of fire is imagery. And on a very popular level, it's often referred to as hell. 
I personally find the term very misleading because it conjures up this idea of some kind of underground torture chamber that has more to do with medieval imagery than it does with the Bible. Uh, sometimes certain Bible translations even use the word hell when they translate in the word Gehenna, which again I think is equally misleading because Gehenna was actually a physical place just outside of Jerusalem. It was this smoldering uh, a garbage dump uh, that they had this continuous fire and, and they would throw their rubbish there and it would consume and destroy all the rubbish. And, and so it became a very fitting symbol for God's final judgment and destruction of all things evil. Again, this, this imagery of a fire that is being used as God's judgment is also, it also comes from and is drawn off a lot of Old Testament passages like Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 24, which says, And they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me. The worms that eat them will not die, and the fire that burns them will not be quenched. So again, this is an image of, of death and destruction, and it was an image that was very fitting for God's final judgment of all things evil. And there's a lot of other imagery within the Bible to refer to judgment, God's final judgment. So you have darkness, weeping, being outside the presence of God. All of this is seen in Matthew chapter 8 and verse 12. You have a watery abyss in Luke chapter 8 and verse 31. You have profound silence in Psalm 31 and verse 17. You have burning sulfur in the presence of God in, in Revelation chapter 14 and verse 10. And so the question comes, well, how do we interpret and understand all this imagery? Well, there are three main views that Christian Bible-believing scholars hold to. So the one is, is a literal view where they believe the ungodly will actually literally be burnt by fire and will be eaten by a worm. And so they believe in an internal conscious suffering. Now, I found this view uh, slightly problematic, uh, firstly and, and mainly because all the imagery is contradictory. It's actually impossible to take all the imagery literally because they're contradictory. So you have fire, yet utter darkness. Uh, you have weeping, yet utter silence. You have a watery abyss, yet fire. Uh, you have in the presence of God, yet separate from the presence of God. So it's impossible uh, to interpret all the imagery literally because they are contradictory. And of course, no scholar actually does uh, interpret them all literally because it's impossible to. So you have a second view, which is the figurative view which believes that all the imagery is pointing to, all the imagery is a symbol of destruction and death. So the worm is a symbol of decay. Fire is a symbol of destruction. And darkness, silence, and the watery abyss is a symbol of uncreation, reversal, reversal of creation. Uh, remember, in Genesis chapter 1, before God begins to create, there is nothing but darkness and a watery abyss, which was a symbol of nothingness. So this is a return to a pre-creation state, to nothingness. And of course, this makes a lot more sense of all the imagery within the Bible, it also makes a lot more sense because it fits in uh, a, a lot better with all the times the Bible talks about God's final judgment and is not using imagery. Um, the Bible generally, when it talks about God's final judgment, talks about the ungodly being destroyed or perishing. So the opposite of eternal life is eternal death. So, uh, for example, Paul never ever uses the imagery of fire and the like. Uh, he, he just never uses it. When Paul, for Paul, the opposite of eternal life is eternal death. The wages of sin is death. 
And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 9, he writes, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and be shut out from the presence of the Lord. Even in the book of Revelation, in chapter 20 and verse 14, it says that the lake of fire is the second death. It's a, a symbol, an imagery of death. And so, of course, this view makes a lot more sense of all the imagery in the Bible, and it also fits in better with the rest of the New Testament's teaching. But what about the imagery of weeping and anguish? It doesn't really deal with that. Uh, and weeping and anguish doesn't seem to be uh, an image for, for destruction and death, but it seems to be more an image for suffering and pain. And so this leads to the, the third view, which is called the final end view. This view basically agrees with everything in the previous view, the figurative view, that all the imagery is symbolic, but they believe that the ungodly will experience a temporary time of suffering before they merely cease to exist forever. So there will be a temporary time of suffering, and then they will merely cease to exist. And they, they draw off passages like Matthew chapter 10 and verse 28, which says, do not be afraid of those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather be afraid of the one who can destroy both the soul and body in hell, in Gehenna, that fiery rubbish dump. And so they believe that all the ungodly will eventually be consumed uh, by the, the, the fire of, of Gehenna or the lake of fire. But they believe that there will be a temporary suffering that leads to the eternal destruction. Now, again, it must be emphasized, they don't believe the imagery is literal. They don't take it literally, so they don't think you're literally going to burn in a fire. But they believe that you will have some kind of temporary suffering that will eventually lead to an eternal destruction. And they believe that the length and the severity of the suffering will be in proportion to what that person deserves. So in the book of Revelation, in both Revelation chapter 20, in chapter 20 and verse 12 and verse 13, it makes it abundantly clear that each person was judged according to what they had done. So everyone will be judged in according to what they had done. So if for those who have raped and murdered, committed a genocide, those who have emotionally, physically, and sexually abused children and remain unrepentant, they will suffer to a far greater degree and severity and length. It will be in proportion to what they have done and deserve. Nobody is going to say, that's unfair. That's not right. Everyone's going to say, that's just. That's right. That's fair. That is what they deserve. What exactly is the nature of this torment? Well, the Bible doesn't tell us very clearly, so we're only left to speculate. We do get a very good clue in a, a Jewish, a first century Jewish writing at the time of Jesus. In 4 Ezra chapter 7 and verse 87, it says, They will utterly waste away in confusion and be consumed with shame, and they will wither with fear at seeing the glory of the Most High. So it seems to me that this this torment would be an inner anguish of guilt and shame and remorse as they come to realize all the, the evil things they have done. And possibly they would even experience, somehow they would experience the, all, all the pain and the emotional suffering that they had caused other people. Somehow for a moment they would experience it. And then they would merely cease to exist. 
So I might still object, but how could a loving God allow people to suffer like this? Even if it is temporary, how could He allow people to suffer like this? Well, if that's your objection, then I need to ask you this question. What exactly do you want God to do? What are you asking God to do? To just forgive past sins and and to give them a fresh start at all costs? Well, that's exactly what God did on the cross. You see, God doesn't want anyone to experience eternal death. God wants to forgive everyone. And so he came and he died for us. He he took our punishment upon himself. He took the, the, the torment of our guilt and shame upon himself so that we could be forgiven and so that we could experience eternal life. But what if the person doesn't want to ask for forgiveness? What if the person doesn't want to have anything to do with God? What should God do then? Should God give them what they want? Well, unfortunately, that's exactly what God does. God will give people what they want. If they want to live apart from Him and have a life apart from Him, He will give them what they want. You see, in the end, there will only be two types of people. There will be those who say, to God, your will be done. And there will be those to whom God says, your will be done. And if you want to live apart from God, God will allow that. But it will lead to suffering and to eternal death. And in fact... It would actually be unloving of God if he did not judge evil. You see, it's only people like us who live a very comfortable, easy life that have a problem with God's judgment. Those who have experienced the genocide, those who have been raped, those who have had a loved one murdered, they crying out for justice. And when you have a, a unrepentant person who has physically, emotionally, and is sexually abused children, and they've lived to a ripe old age, and they seem to get have, have got away with it scot-free, when you have a cruel dictator who has lived to a ripe old age and has had a life of luxury and comfort. People cry out, where is the justice in that? That's not fair. Where is the justice? How could God allow them to get away with it? There's no justice. Oh, there is justice. God doesn't allow them to get away with it. There will be judgment. There will be justice. So in summary, I believe that when a person who is a non-Christian dies, if they have been a, a relatively decent and kind person, They will merely come to the realization that there is a God who loves them, who wants a relationship with them, but they have chosen to have nothing to do with Him. And so God is giving them what they want. And and that realization will bring about shame and remorse if they've been particularly unkind and selfish, then all their unkind and selfish deeds will be exposed, and that will bring about a, an anguish of, of guilt and shame and remorse. And then they will merely cease to exist. On the other hand, those who have been particularly cruel and evil, when all their evil deeds and cruelty are exposed, They would be filled with an intense 
and an incredible anguish of guilt and shame and remorse. And somehow for a moment or two, they're going to be experiencing all that pain that they have caused others to suffer, all that emotional hurt. There will be justice. But for those who have put their faith in Jesus, their name will be written in the book of life, and they will have nothing to fear. For Jesus has paid the price for them. Jesus has taken our punishment. Jesus has taken the, the torment of our, our guilt and our shame and our remorse all upon himself, and he has paid the price for us so we can be forgiven and so we can experience eternal life with him. And this shows us the, the, the price that Jesus paid for us. And when we realize this, it's very hard to contemplate the cross for very long without tears. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this isn't a, an easy subject to talk about or preach on. But Father, we feel it's an important topic to grapple with. And Father, won't you lead us to know how to understand it, how to respond to it, Father, one way we respond is with incredible gratitude for what you did for us on the cross. And Father, we do thank you that there would be justice. We think of all those victims who have suffered endless cruelty at the hands of certain people. Father, we thank you that you don't leave them you don't abandon them. You are ensuring that there is justice for them. And Father, we thank you that there is a hope of a world one day where there will be no more evil, no more suffering, no more death. Father, help us to live in light of the cross. Help us to live in light of the hope that we have. Father, we pray for those who are suffering still, who are suffering at the hands of cruel dictators or, or whatever. Father, won't you be near them, draw near them, and give them hope that there will be justice and there is a hope and a future for them. That evil will be dealt with never to return again. And Father, we thank you that we can we don't have to be fearful. We can know forgiveness. We can know your love. And we can have an incredible hope because of Jesus. And we can say, it is well with my soul. Amen. Thank you for watching. For more information, please visit our website at abergavennybaptist.co.uk